I'm going to talk about trust today. As I emphasized during the last lecture, trust is very important. No trust by people builds no nation. A saying from the Analects of Confucius No trust by people builds no nation. What does this mean? A government that citizens don't believe in can't sustain itself. An organization in which partners don't believe in sponsors will collapse. I can't emphasize this enough. This saying is from the Analects of Confucius. There was a brilliant student of Confucius named Zhigong, who was one of the ten brilliant disciples. The questions or dialogues by the ten disciples were more profound and of higher class than those of younger students. This particular phrase carries so much weight that last year a reporter for the British Financial Times wrote an article about it. Zhigong asked Confucius, What is it to govern? He asked his master what governing really is. Confucius gave a profound answer. Make what abound. Make food abound. In other words, provide a good living for the people. We're talking about politics. What's next? Strengthen the military forces. Make the army stronger. Next comes trust from the people. There are three elements in governing manage the economy well, make the economy prosper, let the people live well fed and comfortably. Second, strengthen the military forces. Third, make the people believe in the government. What I want you to remember here is that Confucius always emphasized having the people in the center. He was people oriented. His philosophy was always people centered. What he really meant here by strengthen the military forces doesn't mean to increase the military power. When the citizens go about with their livelihoods, but outside enemies invade the nation, the citizens will suffer. Who should protect them? The government should. He meant the state must provide adequate protection to its citizens. What is the third element? Make the people believe in the government. One of the ten disciples, Zhigong, asked rather a thorny question Master, if one of these has to be compromised, what should it be? What did Confucius say? Do away with the military. Have people well fed and foster loyalty among them for the government. Then, the relentless Zhigong pestered Confucius again. Master, if unavoidable, what can be compromised among the remaining two? What did Confucius say? Do away with food. What does this mean? You'll soon hear an explanation. He didn't mean that living well was not important. All men are to die eventually either by fighting, getting old, or by starvation. All men die in the end. However, if citizens don't have faith in the government, it will collapse quickly. If people don't believe in the government or leaders, there will be no food and no military forces. Nothing will work. That's why you guys here are not pawns but knights. Every one of you here is number one. Simply put, if your partners don't believe in you, you can't make money. Things won't take off. The moral of this story is that your organization will fall apart eventually. What determines success with the Atomy business lies in the trust between sponsors and partners. No wonder many sociologists came up with a conclusive agreement that the most important social capital is trust. Next. You've all heard the shepherd and the wolf from Aesop's fables, right? Let me elaborate on what really matters here. Let's say there's a partially rotten apple. Is this a good or rotten apple? It definitely is a rotten apple. It gets thrown away. 
Even if the rotten part is small, it's still no good. The principle works like this. If you tell lies 10% of the time and truth 90%, people will disbelieve you 100% of the time. That's how things work. In normal mathematics, 100 minus 1 equals 99, but in business math, it could be zero. That means no one would believe you. Business relationships are not necessarily rational. They're rather emotional. Once people have been deceived by someone, they won't believe that person anymore. This is why I emphasize honesty and goodness. If you mess up your first impression, it is nearly impossible to correct it. First impressions are like concrete, which doesn't break, never. Ah. Uh. Allow me to elaborate further on trust. After World War II, through the Marshall Plan, the U.S. helped to rebuild Western Europe, which was completely ravaged by war. Through this economic assistance, Western Europe recovered remarkably. The same was true for Japan, whose destroyed economy made a complete recovery. In the end, the U.S. was the number one economic superpower. Japan number two, and Germany number three. Therefore, many economists and world organizations thought that capital and technological assistance could improve Africa, South America, or Southeast Asia and could eradicate poverty in the world. Economic assistance was carried out in those nations for a long time. Guess what? It was like a bottomless pit. Things didn't work. In the end, sociologists came to the conclusion that underdeveloped countries are deficient in social capital. Compared to economic capital, social capital takes a much longer time to accumulate and become established. It must be based on trust. All of these qualities are social capital. Public order or keeping one's word is a type of social capital. It takes a painstakingly long time for these things to accumulate. Even a Nobel Prize winning sociologist attributed the cause of those countries' underdevelopment to the deficiency of social capital. It's not a matter of economic capital. Social capital is personal capital from an individual's perspective. Your integrity, your honesty, your observance of law and keeping your word are all personal capital for an individual, yet they are capital for society, without which the society can't grow despite endless investment. Individuals are the same. Again, the most crucial element in the Atomy business is trust. So many Korean MLMs have skyrocketed and plummeted into failure because they had trust problems. Trust is also an important component of erotic capital. According to the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, whose classification of capital has been the most useful and practical for explanation of social phenomena, there are three kinds of social capital. First is economic capital. Economic capital. It includes land, buildings, factories, machinery, and tools. Simply speaking, it's money. What best represents economic capital is money. If you have a lot of money, you're well-to-do, aren't you? Second is cultural capital. Cultural capital. Cultural capital is, in other words, education. It can also be referred to as symbolic capital. Let's say you are conversing with a Harvard graduate. Wouldn't you assume he is well-educated? If someone has a doctorate degree, medical license, lawyer's license, or is a prosecutor or a judge, doesn't that mean something? It's possible through education. This is called cultural capital. Third is social capital. In a single word, your connections. It's your connections. Every human has social capital. All of us have connections. Interestingly, 
For those in low class, their connections cost them money. You have to gift your people whenever they have weddings or funerals, and you don't gain much from those connections. On the other hand, the connections of the upper class people are not like that. Occasionally, you read some articles in the paper that make you angry. A lawyer collects a $100,000 fee for a single phone call from some high up official. If so, are those paying him $100,000 a bunch of idiots? Surely not. They had a good reason to spend that kind of money. That's how connections work. One of the reasons Bordeaux researched this was that Europe has a very high inheritance tax. What is inheritance tax levied on? You pass on your economic capital to your offspring. Amazingly, even with hefty taxes, those people live well in generations to come. In his search for the cause of this, he discovered these. Cultural capital, social capital, and connections. In other words, their possession of great school diplomas, excellent professional designations, and sought after certifications enable them to maintain their upper class connections. Despite hefty tax charges, their economic capital is secured. They can continue to live their cushy lifestyles. So, what about most of us here? Hopeless, isn't it? Oh, you didn't inherit any rental buildings from your parents. That is, you have no economic capital. The balance in your bank account couldn't be lower. You're broke. In addition, you are not a doctor or a lawyer. You have nothing. You don't have much for cultural capital either. All of your connections only cost you money. You would wonder, what the heck is going on with me? There's no entrance to the upper class. It takes capital to go up higher, and you have none. What in the world are you going to do about it? Allow me to introduce a professor named Catherine Hakim from the UK. Catherine Hakim Have you heard of Catherine Hakim? I've mentioned her last success academy. She is an incredibly attractive female professor who teaches at the University of London. A sociologist, she added a fourth capital to this system, which is erotic capital. Importantly, erotic capital is not inherited from parents. Who is responsible for one's own erotic capital? Yourselves. If you are attractive, you can succeed somewhere, somehow. It is somewhat relevant to first impressions as well. You coming here to One Day or Success Academy to increase your knowledge and polish your manners are all parts of enhancing your attractiveness. I'm not simply talking about your looks. There are very attractive people despite their less than desirable appearances. Some models who command high salaries make you wonder if they are good looking at all. However, you must admit they are fascinating, aren't they? Who is responsible for one's erotic capital? It's your responsibility. If you are, you will succeed. In her book, she described many cases of people who managed to succeed thanks to their erotic capital. Almost all of the world's renowned people possess this erotic capital. Statistics say that in elections, people vote for attractive people. They did some experiments in college in Canada and the U.S. asking students to guess who would be selected in upcoming elections and they were almost always correct. The ones they chose were always the most attractive. What's going on here? It is reported that humans take 0.1 seconds to decide whether a person is attractive or not. Our brains make such decisions. Now. Let's study a few cases of such success. Have you heard of Joe Girard? He is the king of automobiles in America. Does he have good credentials? Certainly not. He's a high school dropout. He started working from eight years old. His father was a terrible provider. He struggled at 40 or so jobs until the age of 35, when he finally went completely bankrupt. How could he make ends meet 
after going bankrupt. He had no money, no place to live, and no possessions. Everything was taken away from him when he was defrauded. The only thing he could do was sell cars as a penniless person. A car salesman, he decided to sell cars. One day, he discovered that his wife and kids were starving. He was penniless, no house, no car, and no possessions after being defrauded. He became determined that no matter what, he would take care of his family. Isn't that admirable? Gerard made it in the Guinness Book of World Records 12 years in a row. A record which is still unbroken to this day. When he asked a friend to get him hired as a car salesman, he was turned down. Here is why his friend turned him down. When customers walk into a car dealership, which is sort of like anatomy center, salesmen take turns meeting customers like one, two, three. So if there is one more salesman, what will happen? The chance of making money for those existing salesmen decreases. No wonder his friend turned him down. Gerard got hired on the condition that he would not solicit the customers visiting the dealership. Only on that kind of condition was he able to get hired. To his curiosity, he discovered that other salesmen had customer lists. Everyone had a customer list. Gerard had no list. What did he do? Here is a typical phone book in America. There are three sections in American phone books. White pages have people's phone numbers. Yellow pages are for commercial business numbers. Lastly, blue pages are for government agencies. Out of those three sections, he needed people's numbers. He started working with four pages of white pages ripped out of the phone book. All other salesmen had a list, but he didn't. This was a first for him and he had no resources. He ripped out four pages from a phone book. He had to start somehow. On one day, a customer came by the dealership. Gerard had promised not to approach dealership visiting customers, right? However, this time he could without breaking the promise. All other salespeople went home. There was no salesman, so he could deal with this customer. He successfully made his first sale. This was his very first sale. You'd think people would clearly remember their first sales, wouldn't you? But he can't remember. He wrote many books, by the way. Here is the reason why he has no recollection. He doesn't remember what vehicle or to whom he sold. To Gerard, the customer only appeared as a loaf of bread. One thing he remembers is that the customer worked for Coca-Cola. He only remembers that the customer looked like bread and cola. He was that desperate. He knew his wife and kids were going to starve to death if he didn't make any sales. What does this slide say? If you want to succeed in sales, what is required? Without an ardent desire, you can't succeed. Forget it. If you don't have resolute determination that you will make it, things will not work out for you. All drive comes from this attitude. Furthermore, you will come up with brilliant ideas for sales. Why don't you tell me if these numbers mean anything? If you can sell 18 automobiles a day, it's impossible not to get rich. Gerard did thorough post-sale customer care. Never did he cheat his customers. Here is how car salesmen cheat. Let's say a customer wants an ABC car. Gerard would gladly sell that ABC car and not try to talk the customer into buying something else that would benefit him more. The bottom line was that he never cheated or told lies to make short-term profits. When some people tried to lowball him, he would persuade them. Sir, with that kind of low price, I must try to recoup from other customers. I would have to take a loss on this one. I can't do deals that bring loss to everyone involved. He did his business in a very fair and reasonable way. Also, his strength was his thorough post-sale customer care. He would inform his customers of upcoming part replacements, maintenance schedules, 
or service visits. Once people bought a car from him, they didn't have to worry about their auto maintenance. Gerard did it all. What happened was that he didn't have to look for customers himself. People came to him and his old customers brought him tons of referrals. No wonder he sold 18 cars in one day. It was Joe Gerard who said that ardent desire brings many ideas. This was one of the episodes from his book. One day, the mother of a friend of his passed away, so he went to her funeral that was held in a Catholic church. All of a sudden, he had a burning question. There was someone passing out literature that described the deceased person's life and accomplishments. He became curious. I wondered how he knew how many guests would attend and prepared the right number of pamphlets. Is that a difficult question? It's just a matter of interest. Then a reply came. About 250 attend. Why did you prepare 250? Usually 250 people show up. Aha! 250 people show up. One of his customers happened to be a pastor of a Protestant church. Pastors give service all the time, don't they? Father, do you give service at funerals? Yes, I do. Why? Do you have any idea how many guests show up? The pastor also said about 250 people attend. This time he went to the wedding of a friend and saw cake was being passed out to guests. Again, Gerard got curious as to how much cake was prepared and asked, How many guests did you prepare cake for? About 250 guests. Weddings and funerals are extremely important events in an individual's life, aren't they? The fact that about 250 people show up to these very special events means that 250 people are involved somehow and have relationships with you. What lesson did he learn from this? What would happen if you messed up with one customer? That would equate to losing 250 prospective customers. Is this some profound discovery? It's only a matter of paying attention. He said in his book that every time he interacted with a customer, he treated them as if he were dealing with 250 customers. However, it was easier said than done. Why? He caught himself being nicer to affluent-looking people than poor-looking people such as manual laborers. Of course, nobody knows who other people know. Gerard said in his book it took him a year to train himself. It was hard to treat people equally and took him a year. He made a tremendous amount of effort. When I was commuting to my military academy in a rural area, there were so many diners and inns near the train and bus stations. The number of inns and diners was incredible. However, none of the diners were worth eating there. Why? It's because the people who did business there had a mindset that customers were flyby and not repeat customers. Customers were treated as flybys. That's not always true, though. Somehow, we managed to find a decent noodle shop which was very good. We then told my junior officers to go to that noodle shop near the station. Only that noodle shop was doing good business. Unfortunately, those business people had no idea about 250 prospects. The moral of this lecture is that whenever you deal with partners or new consumers, you must remember that there are 250 potential customers out there for each of them. Don't you ever treat your people lightly because they might look less than well-to-do. With that mindset, you won't succeed. I hope you become royal masters in three to five years. Thank you for listening. <laughs>